Hello and welcome to The Apex, a weekly conversation with the titans and tastemakers of the automotive world. If you've been enjoying our podcast series so far, please do leave us a review on whatever platform you're listening on to help us climb up the rankings and share The Apex with the world. And so to today's show. No stranger to life at the highest level of the classic car game, our guest this week is Peter Warman, experienced auctioneer with RM Sotheby's, entrepreneur and classic car specialist. With a background in advertising and decades of experience in and around the world's finest cars, Peter is uniquely placed to navigate the choppy waters of this exciting market. Today he does so from the helm of his business, PJ Wallman Classic Sporting Motorcars and Motorboats. Peter, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. So could you tell us uh, first um, a bit about your first experiences with cars? What sparked the passion for them? Well, I guess like uh, many people in the bit, we don't have a sort of family history of collecting cars, but my father was a car lover um, and I had a, you know, a, a lovely sort of uh, aluminium pedal car when I was very young. In fact, I don't remember it very well. I just remember it in black and white photos, but mm-hmm. I know I was passionate about it. That, of course, led to a Scalextrix once I was old enough, which was about 18 months, according to my father. <laughs> and that had, you know, classic Grand Prix cars. And in fact, I also had the seven inch record that went with it that many won't oh. remember, but that would play in the background. You have a countdown to the race. So I guess from a very early age, I was building up some um, enthusiasm for, for motor cars. Mm-hmm. My father also, before he got married, had a, a very nice um, Healy 3000 in old English white. It, uh, red leather interior with uh, white wall tires. It was quite a glamorous looking car for, mm-hmm. for that era. Um, I never saw the car, but I saw, I think there's only one black and white photo existing of it in the family. But even that, uh, you know, I remember looking at the picture. Dad was proud of it. Uh, he sold it to get married and never bought anything similar um, afterwards. And also as a kid, you know, going out, uh, I, I grew up in London, but we'd often mm-hmm. see cars on the road in the 70s. And, and the thing that attracted me particularly mm-hmm. to the older cars was spinners on wire wheels. I don't know what it was, but oh, yeah. driving behind a car and seeing the, the wire wheel spinners spinning away, it, it felt very James Bond. And somehow, mm-hmm. you know, it's that combined with chrome. Um, you know, a combination of all of those things. And, you know, when we'd see a, a, a classic car, which was probably less classic in, in the 70s than it would be today, something mm-hmm. like an E-Type or even an MGB or a Healy on the roads in the UK, we'd always be attracted to it. So that really, mm-hmm. I suppose, sparked and uh, piqued my early interest. Mm-hmm. So a childhood filled with all the best influences then? Mm, I'd say. So you began your career, your working life, working in advertising. Um, so what prompted you to make the move into specializing in classic cars later on? Well, I worked in the advertising industry for a number of years in London. Then I had a stint in, in Manhattan and uh, met my wife, who's Italian, from Milan. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the short version of the story is we decided to move to Milan. Um, I, felt, I felt that having... Uh, I wanted to learn Italian. I, my wife wanted really to develop her early career in Italy. I think it was going to be better for her. So we moved to Milan. And after about a year of working in the advertising industry, I was working for J. Walter Thompson. I decided mm-hmm. I, I'd like a change. I wasn't that excited by advertising in Italy. And um, I, I took my E-Type Jaguar to um, Milan with me. And I was mm. using it to go to various events. I don't know the... Um, I did a couple of rallies. I would go to Villa d'Este and go to various concours, as well as mm-hmm. the uh, Coppa into Europa, which was held at the Monza racetrack. And I was meeting people and attending these events. And I was going in a, in an E-Type Jaguar, which uh, the Italians would refer to as La Macchina di Diabolic. <laughs> I thought, well, why not try to make a career out of this? And at the time, buying the magazines, uh, the, yeah. the most frequent advertiser was probably Coys, Coys of Kensington. Well, at least for mm. my, to me, this was the early 2000s. They were one of the more recognized auction houses. So I, um, I wrote to them and I said, are you doing any business in Italy? They said, well, a little bit. We'd like to do more. And I said, well, I, mm-hmm. I speak Italian. I go to all of the events. I, I, I drive an old banger around and, and get noticed for that reason. Why don't mm-hmm. you um, let me try to represent you? So that was really how I migrated over. I did a, mm-hmm. a, a stint with Coys based in Italy, helped them to put their name on the map a little bit more over there. And we started the pad of a auction. But then when I moved back to London, um, Max Girardo had um, 
not long opened the office of RM Sotheby's. This was 2006 stroke 2007. And I got a call out of the blue asking if I'd like to get involved. And of course, I um, I grabbed the chance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And just kind of sticking to, to that early period in advertising, it was a question that just popped into my mind before this. I mean, what do you think of car advertising these days? I mean, I know you know, you specialize in classic cars, but it seems that looking at some of the contemporary adverts, even for things like your E-Type, it seems that the language people have used to to sell these these dreams, is, it seems to have changed completely. I wondered if you had any kind of perspective on that. Do you mean uh, advertising for modern cars or you mean advertising in classic car magazines? Well, I, I guess mainly modern cars, but probably a bit of both, actually. Well, I guess, I mean, without wanting to touch on the politics of it all, I think in general advertising has huge restrictions today. I think most big brands are more interested in telling people um, how they behave as companies. And there's a lot of virtue signaling going along, going on. And I think that's a, a big distraction from the product and the aspiration that perhaps you know, uh, we, we would have seen. I, I remember one of my favorite advertising campaigns was the Renault Clio with Nicole in, in mm-hmm. France. And I, I, you couldn't make those advertisements today, but at, at the time they were iconic and it was fun, mm-hmm. it was playful. And it, it was, they, they said, well, what's the type of person that we'd like to see driving our car? And they did it. I mean, I worked with the, um, when I worked for Ogilvy and May, the, uh, one of the clients was Ford. And they would spend an absolute, fortune on photographing cars, re-photographing mm-hmm. cars, and, and just getting them to look right. But I think today there are so many different angles and platforms for um, advertising, Instagram and social media being one mm. of them. Mm. Um, I think the messaging's changed an awful lot. And, mm. and um, I think advertisers in general are just a little bit nervous about being mm-hmm. playful and, and, and making these things fun because there's perhaps a bit too much virtue signaling coming into it. And, and have you seen any change in the way that people talk about classic cars in the same vein? Well, I, not really. I mean, I, I, I guess Instagram has been the greatest um, new platform for brokers, auction houses to bring attention to what they're doing. I, I mean, in my own advertising, I've tried to approach it more typographically because I have a passion for it. Mm-hmm. Just really hoping to stand out, but also I enjoy it. I, you know, I've always loved things like Blue Note album covers, which are mm-hmm. beautifully designed and recognizable from 100 feet away. Mm. Um, I guess it's striking a balance between showing people what you have for sale by having you know, nice pictures of cars I guess one thing that has changed um, in the quality of advertising, increasingly people are, well, in at least the last 10 years, have been employing extremely good uh, professional photographers. Mm. I think, you know, snapping a photograph of a car on a driveway or at the roadside is is not really the way to do it anymore. Mm. Even on Instagram, there are more and more professional photographers and videographers <laughs> getting involved mm. and raising, raising the quality of the imagery. Mm. Yeah. Those are some very, very interesting insights. Thanks for uh, thanks for that. So maybe back to your career. So you spent a decade at RM Sotheby's as a car specialist <clears throat> and eventually a managing director. So um, for those listeners who might not be that familiar with with what the lifestyle looks like, could you tell us a bit more uh, about what the lifestyle of a globetrotting uh, car specialist looks like? Well, I guess, I mean, globetrotting is, is quite true. I mean, everybody, the, the great thing about RM Sotheby's or RM Auctions, as it was back in 2007 when I originally joined the company, is that it was an American, Canadian American company that came to Europe and it came mm-hmm. to Europe in a very big way. The very first sale that RM held in, in Europe was, in fact, in 2007 in May at the Ferrari factory in Maranello, followed by London with the Bernie Ecclestone sale, both of which mm. were extremely exciting and gave RM a, a running start, at least a running start at the European marketplace. Mm-hmm. But everyone wanted to go to Monterey. Everyone wanted to go to the US auctions. Um, we one, one particularly exciting opportunity I had was when we had the um, James Bond DB5 from Goldfinger for sale. Uh, I think that was 2009, possibly, or maybe a bit later, maybe 11. But anyway, we had the opportunity through the relationship with Sotheby's to fly that out to Hong Kong for Asian Art Week. And we had Mm -hmm. it on display 
uh, at Sotheby's among the art collections. And, and that was really exciting. So, yeah, I think going, getting to travel to Asia, traveling all over the U.S., on the West Coast, in beautiful places at beautiful times of year is, of course, exciting. But the challenges balance that. I think the challenges of working in the auction business are the first really is managing client expectations. One mm. might say that auctions in the last 10 to 15 years are possibly a victim of their own success because mm. it's the great results, the huge cars that make much more than uh, people expect them to make that mm. make the headlines and people remember. And of course, anybody put in their car at auction big or small or you know inexpensive or very expensive hopes to achieve the same result and of mm. course like children we all think our car is the best one on the planet <laughs> um the other challenge is yeah. that once uh, let, uh, when i say a mass-produced car I, I mean a car that wasn't sort of one of 20 let's say mm -hmm. a car that was one of a thousand yeah um when one particular car makes a good result uh, the, the market tends to get a bit flooded with other cars following mm. And of course, you can't continue to sustain that level of interest and um, and price mm -hmm. because you make the car look a lot more, you make it easy to find. And I think the thing about auctions is if you put something in that's hard to find that hasn't been on the market for some time, yeah. you'll get the world's attention. Mm -hmm. And that's what auction houses are hoping for. So, of course, the battle as a specialist is to have your client um, enter their car at a pricing level that's going to attract good interest. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean making it cheap, but what it means is making it attractively priced. So, you know, that's how you get the two, three, four, five people bidding on it. If you mm -hmm. put it in at your dream price and, 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 and push the auction house to put a, a high estimate on it, people mm. will be put off. They'll say, look, I, I, I'm not going to enter the game at that level. So you've got to find mm. the right balance. You've got to th get, get, get the opportunity, get the car moving and give the auctioneer something to work with. Mm. And you've seen in recent, in the last couple of years, a trend that was hot in the US migrate more over to Europe, which is no reserve cars. Mm. And no reserve basically means that the car is for sale at any price. Now, of course, nobody's going to let it go at any price. But what yeah. it does do is it says to potential buyers that my highest bid will buy the car. I'm not bidding against the reserve price. Mm. So that excites people. It gets them interested. And we've seen a lot of success with uh, no reserve or auctions without reserve prices. Mm. And from what you were describing there earlier about, I guess, managing client expectations, it sounds like sometimes the job could be quite a, it's quite a personal industry um, that requires maybe a bit of, a bit more people management than, than some people would expect. Yeah, it is a personal industry. I think, um, firstly, you're dealing with people's money or possessions. They've taken it out of their business. So these are, um, in many cases, highly successful entrepreneurs, business owners, industrialists mm -hmm. who have, who, who've built great companies <clears throat> and they're used to business to business relationships. Yeah. But when you get somebody turn up to talk to them about selling their car, which is in, in most cases money that they've taken out of their business for personal use. It is a more personal deal and you have to treat it that way. You have to treat it with that respect. You have to understand that this isn't just about the money. This is a car that perhaps they've owned for a number of years. It might be a car that they've inherited. And of course, there are people that are, uh, that are playing the market. Of, of course, we know that. Um, sometimes uh, dealers will put their cars into auction. But in the main, you are dealing with um, uh, personalities and individuals and it can take some time to to build those relationships and build that trust. Mm -hmm. And very often, you know, there's a lot of, um, let's say, quite young, youngish people working in the auction industry. And they're, yeah. they're, they're often faced with perhaps someone in their 60s or 70s who's, who's yeah. retired. And in a normal business environment, that relationship, I'm not being ageist here, <laughs> but I'm just saying, you know, if you're, if you're 70 years old and you've got a three million pound car and yeah. somebody in their late 20s walks in, it's hard work for the for the auction yeah. guy. It doesn't matter how good he is at his job or how well he knows the cars. He first has to develop a relationship with someone that's forty years his senior. We, were that, you ever in course. that sort of position as well? No, I'm old. Uh, no, that's. <laughs> I, I guess that's why it's a second career. The auction, the, yeah, the advertising yeah. industry is very much a young man's career, and if you don't own your own agency by the time you're forty, you may as well change careers. <laughs> that's brilliant. Um, <clears throat> 
And, and more recently, um, you've gone on to taking uh, more public-facing roles on compare duties at events like the London Concourse and Hampton Court. Uh, at least I've certainly seen quite a few videos of you in that role. Um, how did you gravitate towards that? And uh, does it kind of give you a better perspective on what's going on, maybe a, a bit more interaction with younger collectors and, and things like that? Well, first, I mean, I love doing it. Um, I guess part of that um, skill set comes from having worked in the advertising industry, having to stand up mm-hmm. in, in meeting rooms with 10, 15 people in and presenting ideas and discussing things. So I've always enjoyed doing it. Um, but it actually, as far as what I do today is concerned, which is an addition to my sort of main business, um, started in fact in 2011 uh, at Salon Privé at Sion, Sion House when RM... Mm-hmm auctions at the time had an auction there and they decided they wanted to present the cars um a bit i I guess the benchmark is villa Mm d'este they wanted to present the cars individually uh they asked me if i'd like to do it i said yes great let's 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 have a go i i I very much enjoyed doing that And and at that moment one of my colleagues from the u.s was present and he said well you did a, a nice job, an okay job, a decent job. Um, why don't you <laughs> yeah. come and present the cars for us at our American auctions? And it's mm. kind of, they call it in the US the color guy. It's the guy that, you know, as, as you, you will have seen, auctions in the US at least a, a number of years ago, a bit more razzmatazz, more pizzazz, perhaps more mm-hmm. dynamic. There's, the, 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 there's more interaction between the auctioneer and the audience. And, and mm-hmm. Often as well, they bring the cars live onto the stage and have a turntable. Mm. So in that time, in that two or three minutes or two minutes where it takes the um, the car handlers to get the car started onto the stage, it's a great time to pick out some of the highlights and talk about the car. Mm. And also, if there's a pause in the bidding, there's a good opportunity to step in and give the auctioneer a chance to have a glass of water and think about what he's doing. <laughs> so I think when you know when the auctioneer is, I, I worked. Um, with Max Gerardo, as, as you will all know, for, for some years yeah. uh, working on the auction rostrum. And it, it's a double act and it's enjoyable. It's fun. I think you take the pressure off of each other. Obviously, mm-hmm. it's the auctioneer that's handling the bids and the money. But if you can give him a little bit of time to pause for thought, put his head down, look at his numbers, look around the room and you can mm-hmm. provide the filler, then, yeah. it, you know, I think it, I think it's beneficial all round. Following which, um, RM was sponsoring uh, the Concours of Elegance, which started um, in 2012. The first one was at Windsor Castle. Mm -hmm. And again, with that event, at first at Windsor Castle, circumstances didn't allow for moving the cars around, or rather the layout of uh, the quadrangle didn't allow Mm -hmm. for presenting the cars. But once we moved the event to Hampton Court Palace, um, there's much more space. It's a lot more flexible for driving cars. So we've developed that, and, and I present the cars or compare the event alongside uh, Richard Charlesworth, who, who, having worked for many years at Bentley, is very used to public speaking. He has a beautiful, silky tones. And again, it's a double act. And frankly, uh, you know, I love doing it as a double mm-hmm. act because you play off of each other. You can introduce some humor. He's a bit older than me, so I yeah. like to refer to him as, you know, Uncle, Uncle Richard or Dad, <laughs> which he, of course he hates. But it, it just makes the whole event, um, yeah. I think, more dynamic, more exciting. And, and, and now we do three days uh, yeah. full time, including all sorts of interviews. And, and, and it's, a good, it's a good way of um, getting your face, continuing to have your face out there, meeting yeah. people. Um, and, and, and three days go very quickly. Yeah, well, that, those are some really cool, actually, cool insights there. Um, so let's talk about um, your, your your current business. So recently, you founded PJ Wallman Classic Sporting Motorcars and Motorboats. Um, I just wanted to ask, what was the connection between cars and and boats? Well, firstly, I've recognised uh, yet again that the the name of the business is a mouthful. Um, <laughs> but you know, I, I, I'm I've. Um, done the complete opposite to what I always wanted to do or always suggested to other people they ought to do, which is not to put your name above the door of the business, because I think that, you know, for future, for the future of the business, it's sometimes better if it's a little bit anonymous, but frankly, Mm. I couldn't think of a name. (laughs) And I wanted people to know that I was offering boats as well. And the, the background is quite simply when I left RM Sotheby's in 2017, Um, I then went on to work on a new project, an online uh, business for a Mm -hmm. couple of years. 
we decided to um, to park that for a little while. We we felt that the timing wasn't quite right for it, so we parked that last year. And in the summer, I I thought that it it, it would be good for me to set up on my own, having mm-hmm. not wished to do so originally. And the reason I didn't want to do so when I left RM is just. It's a very crowded space. There are mm. lots of auction houses, particularly in the UK. You know, we can name six or seven auction houses just specializing in classic yeah. cars and probably 20 plus very, very competent, experienced, high end dealers who deal mm. at the very top end of the market. So I just felt, I felt, I thought to myself, what, how am I going to distinguish myself? And of course, personality and contacts come into it, mm. but it's also extremely competitive. So because I speak Italian, because I have reason to be in Italy quite frequently, I thought I'd focus as much as I can on finding cars in Italy and trying to bring them to the international marketplace. Mm-hmm. And the um, the Riva side of it is is more, I bought a Riva about seven years ago and since acquired another. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I recognize, firstly, the boats are... Um, I think undervalued when, especially mm-hmm. when looked at in the context of collectors' cars. Mm-hmm. But secondly, it's quite an under, underdeveloped marketplace. Uh, many of the boatyards that look after the boats and restore them also do sales, but it's not mm-hmm. really a very um, commercialized uh, business. And at yeah. first, I thought, well, I don't want to do this. It may spoil my love of Reavers. But I just felt, and excuse the pun, that I can provide a bridge between the sort of Italian <laughs> third generation family business and yeah. a more international market. Yeah. And yeah. at the same time, I think um, people that love classic cars, I, I'm very surprised to hear of any that don't also enjoy Reavers, at least to yeah. look at. Um, and I think a little bit of education is needed. I think people need mm-hmm. to learn um, where they can keep them, how easy it is to maintain them. There's lots of fear in the market. You have to varnish it every time you put it yeah. put it into the water, and of course that's not true. <laughs> the motors are big Chevrolet V8s, you know, that are used yeah. in multiple applications. So they're in fact quite easy to um, to find and quite easy to uh, uh, rebuild. Could you, I mean, could you cost. tell us uh, just a bit more about Reva itself as a, as, a, as a make? I think it's kind of I, I know that they've done a few collaborations with some car makers recently, but I think. Generally, I mean, I, I certainly don't know too much about them, aside from the fact they make nice looking boats. Well, of course, the, I mean, the, the brand was in, is a historic brand. Um, I think Carlo Reeve was the third, third generation. He's, his father built uh, classic boats, mostly uh, fishing boats and rowing boats. Mm-hmm. But Carlo Reeve decided he could build super high end um luxury sporting motorboats and he he's he started doing it that immediately after the war mm. he made a couple of um small production volume models in the early days but that then developed into the um the Ariston which is a single engined um day boat really a runabout beautifully mm. finished in mahogany in that classic reaver arrow shape um, I think many would say the Ariston is is the the prettiest of all of the mm. Reavers. He then went on to make a twin engine version of the Ariston called the Tritoni. And at first, the, these boats were powered by Chris Craft six cylinder engines. He then um, began to uh, get his engine supply from the US V eights and started to install more powerful engines. Mm. But you know, overall. There's only about 3,000 classic wooden reavers surviving today of around 4,000 which were built when Carlo Reaver was still at the helm of the company. He sold the company in the late 60s, early 70s to Whitaker. Um, he remained involved with the business, but he'd sold it. But if you look at the production of classic reavers, and I guess that means up to the Aquarama, there's only, there was only around 4,000 built, around th- approximately 3,000 surviving. Mm. Um, so I think it's in- incredibly rare. I describe it as others do as the Ferrari of the boat world. It mm. has that brand, uh, kudos. I think, you know, if you speak to people about classic wooden motorboats, the brand is synonymous with, with the, with the product. Um, mm. it's very much part of that La, La Dolce Vita era, California mm. spiders, Lancia Aurelia spiders, that sort of thing. Um, and you know, from a usability point of view, I guess I'm very fortunate because I have reasons to be in Milan on a regular basis and I yeah. keep my boats on Lago Maggiore, which is 
30 minutes from um, Malpensa Airport. But in fact, they're actually, in my view, relatively inexpensive to keep if you keep them on an Italian lake mm-hmm. um, and relatively affordable to maintain and, 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 and huge fun to, um, to use. Yeah, I, I bet. I mean, that does sound extremely glamorous. Um, and I'm speaking of La Dolce Vita, I hear you have, well, I know you have a Jaguar E-Type of your own. You mentioned it earlier. Um, could you tell us a bit more about the story of that particular car? Because I think it's quite special to you, isn't it? It is. Um, well, I my first car, I got my driver's license uh, weeks after my 17th birthday. And uh, I got a small budget to buy a car from my parents. Uh, mm-hmm. and a lot of my friends were buying, I, I guess, golfs and hot hatches, talking about the sort of late 80s. I always wanted a classic car. So I found, um, I found an MGB Roadster, 1969 MGB Roadster. And it had all the things that I wanted in a classic car, leather seats, lots of chrome wire wheels, you know, lovely chrome bezels on the, um, on the instruments, which glistened in the sun. Mm-hmm. And a lovely uh, uh, and a raspy exhaust note. It was perfect. I used that car for about a year and a year and a half, um, maintaining it myself. I sold that for a, a TR6, um, and this was when the market was starting to pick up again at the end of the eighties, or in fact starting to boom. And uh, mm-hmm. so I bought my TR6 with the proceeds from the MGB for three thousand pounds and sold it for eight after spending quite a bit of money on it, and. Um, my father and I, well, in fact, my father found an E-Type coupe for sale, uh, gunmetal grey. It just so happened to be chassis number 49 uh, mm. of the right-hand drive coupe, so a very early car. Mm. That wasn't really the reason I bought it. I always liked the, um, the aluminium centre console on the early E-Types and the bucket seats, mm. but I didn't buy it because of that chassis number. I wasn't really in the car business. It was just, yeah. it came up and I, I got excited and wasn't prepared to wait and look at 20 others. Like Absolutely. I guess any other twenty-one year old would. I can so, understand. Yeah, I had um, yeah. I had an E-Type coupe at twenty-one. Um, I used to drive it into the office occasionally in Soho. <laughs> I've driven it down to the south of France um, for camping holidays in Saint Tropez. I kept it when I was living in Italy. I've had the engine out many times on the clutch. You know, looked after it myself. Um, well, with my father, and um, I've had it now thirty-two years. It's recently been treated to a to a proper restoration. It was restored before I bought it, but it was done very much to 1980s British mm-hmm. restoration <laughs> standards. So um, yeah. I'm afraid a lot of the old brazing and uh, poor repairs had to be cut out and redone. But I was oh, fortunate in that I took it to um, RS Panels, uh, Bob Smith, who mm-hmm. I don't think there's anybody better uh, to, to look after an original E-type. So he, yeah. he did the bodywork for me. Um, and I've now had it retrimmed into its original interior color, which mm-hmm. is light blue. It was black when I bought oh, it. So I think I'm going to say now that if I had to find an E-Type, I would be looking for a gunmetal gray car with light blue interior. I just think it's absolutely stunning. I've probably mm-hmm. done 100, 100 plus thousand miles in it. Um, and I use it as much as, as possible as yeah. recently as the Goodwood Revival. Yeah, it's, um, it's so good to hear that, that, that it's being used as, as intended. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I did, I, I did in fact also buy um, another car because I now have two young children. I bought a, th- a Ferrari 365 GT2 Plus 2, uh, also known as the Queen Mary. Mm-hmm. And I've just driven that down to Italy and back with the kids and a car seat in the back and full of luggage. I, I, I guess my, my love of classic cars is more about the beauty of the object, the beauty mm-hmm. of the journey and of the experience. I quite like maintaining them myself uh, to a point. Less so today than maybe twenty years ago, but I've got a reasonable idea what's gone wrong if it uh-huh. if it breaks down or something starts making a, a strange noise. Yeah. So I guess that helps me along the way. But you know, being able to take my, my two young kids and my wife and all of the luggage down to um, northern Italy and back in a Ferrari is is just a joy. Um, yeah. So who, who says they can't be practical, right? Well, I, I, you know that. I think they are practical. And, and um, as many people will tell you, the more you use them, the better they get. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And is there a motorboat equivalent of the E-Type or, or the Ferrari for you, a particular model that, that you um, own? Or, well, or, I guess, or I guess. I mean, my, uh, by pure coincidence, my Ariston is from 1961. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and I think it's super pretty. 
it's it carries less passengers than an Aquarama. Um, you know, it's not a it's not a huge engine, a three point eight litre six cylinder, and um, I, I, so I guess the Ariston you you, you might compare to the uh, to the E Type in many respects. Mm-hmm. Yes, mm-hmm. yeah, that's very very interesting indeed. So um, we, we're coming up on time, so just had a few quick fire questions to to end with. Um, the first of which is. What's been the most memorable auction or sale you've presided over? I guess we could call it a career highlight. Well, I mean, there are, there's there's more than one, but I'll, just conscious of time, I think I have to say all of the Ferrari sales, but the first London auction that we held in uh, 2007, I managed to encourage an Italian to send 20 cars from his collection to that sale. We had Bernie Ecclestone there. The auction was very much a blank sheet of paper. We were a very small team in in London. I think five people in in, in the office, including um, the founding the founder of RM's two children. So, mm. and, and we tried to present that auction differently to any that had been done before. Uh, we raised Bernie Ecclestone's 540k special roadster up from behind the stage. Mm-hmm. We held a big party. We had the BBC there, ITV, lots of PR. And I guess that really put RM on the map uh, yeah. in those days. And it was nice because it was a blank sheet of paper and we, we could all be creative with it. Yeah, that's, that sounds like a really exciting event to have been a part of. Mm. Um, so my second question, uh, you might have kind of answered it already, but your favorite place to go boating? It has to be uh, Lago Maggiore, um, which is where I keep my boats. But I, yeah, it's um, the main... Apart from the fact the lake is beautiful and you can navigate three hours all the way up into Switzerland, mm-hmm. the boat yard where I keep them with is third generation mm-hmm. family business. Um, it's uh, it's it's affordable. They they're passionate about what they do, mm-hmm. um, and that makes a difference. It's like if you owe, if you own a a race car and you've got a fantastic team that look after you, um, that mm-hmm. makes all the difference if you mm-hmm. trust them implicitly. So for me, Lago Maggiore for sure. Very nice. And last question, um, and it's a really unfair one that we ask all classic car specialists, but what is your money, no object classic car? And there can be only one. Choose one. <laughs> it has to be one. If it has to be one, it's not a car I'd be able to drive, but I think it has, you know, it's it's around the period I was born. I remember mm-hmm. it in, in movies and scale electrics. It has to be the um, Ferrari P4 sports racing car. I think that just has every quality i i want in a car in terms of beauty and performance history brand everything but i did make a note of about four like four other cars <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's a great one to end on um peter thanks so much for your time today and, and for a really great interview okay my pleasure thanks for asking the apex is powered by custodian a new platform for car enthusiasts designed to help you manage your car from anywhere Using the latest technology, it takes the pain out of ownership and lets you just enjoy the drive, because Custodian will take care of the rest. So if you believe life starts after 6,000 RPM, you need to be on Custodian. Join us now at www.custodian.club to sign up for early access and get ready to enjoy your car like never before.